Podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors Podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to episode 161 of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with myself, Jackie Jones, and the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook. And what we're going to be looking at in this episode is separation and individuation in the therapy process. That's a mouthful, that, Bob. <laughs> Well, it's a good title. I like quite like the title. It's yeah, your it's title. Actually... They're all good. <laughs> I suppose it is a mouthful. Separation and individuation within the psychotherapy process. Yes. Good. Okie dokie. So let's start let's start the podcast then. So Absolutely. separation. Yeah, yeah. So separation and individuation. <sighs> a French name for this this sort of developmental time, which is um, one and a half till four, really. Um, yeah. Some people say one and a half to three and a half in developmental terms. One and a half to three and a half age. Um, in the French sort of language, they call that, the, they call this separation, individuation phase psychologically, the rapprochement stage. Yes. So, so if if you think if you know this developmental time that I'm talking about here, where we start to, um, in theory, separate and individuate from our significant other, it's sometimes called the rapprochement stage. Have yeah. you heard of this? You know what I'm talking yeah. about, Jack? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So this is the time in devel in the developmental, sorry, in the developmental aspects of the psyche. Uh, this is a time about one and a half when we start to separate from our significant caretaker taker for the first time and leap out for autonomy, if you like, or leap, step out our first steps of self-agency. And um, if there's problems in this particular era, era, if you like, developmentally, then there'll be consequences psychologically, not only at that time in life, but will appear at the next particular stage, which is in the adolescent stage, uh, when it's more concreted up, if you like. And certainly, if those developmental stages or tasks aren't completed, so self-agency is um, limited, um, then then they will then people have may have problems psychologically later in life around independence or you know um being engulfed or leading to codependent relationships or leading to over anxious states so it's very important the these developmental steps at this early stage of our life in terms of healthy psychological mental health as time goes on yeah i i love this sort of stuff um, yeah, I refer to it as ages and stages, and it's something psychologically that we all go through, yeah, naturally anyway. But that, when I'm talking with clients about this, I always talk about that 18 months to three, four years old, as if, and I can remember my kids doing it, like at play group, mm -hmm. when they go off and play for a bit, but they're constantly looking back just to check if you're still there. Mm. And it, it's that, yeah, I'm okay. I can go off and do something. You're not gonna abandon me. You're not gonna leave me. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Which to me, I think is a really important phase in our growing up and the fact, yeah, that we we have secure attachments to people around us. Mm. I think it also that. happens in relationships as well, doesn't it? You know, yeah. that a certain time when we've been with somebody that we mm we're kind of okay going out and doing our own thing, knowing that the other person is going to be there when we come back. Mm. That's absolutely right. And I like the point that you made, so I'll reiterate it, that in, in inverted commas, growing up, this stage we're talking about here, the separation, individuation, or the prospect stage, is normal, healthy, and we all go through it. Yeah. And yeah. 
we have to. Yes. We have to in terms of growing up. Yeah. Hopefully. The problem comes, of course, when, you know, issues happen in that particular stage, one and a half to four, where things go wrong. Yes. Between the significant caretaker, I say mother, because there always have to be mother, but we'll say mother here, and the child. Yeah. So what should happen in terms of promoting self-agency and independence or autonomy is that the mother supports the child in these first steps of freedom and positively strokes them so that the child feels supported and knows that the mother will be there as a constant object as they take these first steps and come back. Yeah. That the mother is there in a dependable way. And there's a level of positive strokes for these first steps into self agency. If that doesn't happen, why, there's many consequences, but one of them might be say the mother doesn't support the child in that process. Yeah. Yeah. Or somehow withdraws strokes or there's a neglectful process, then the child or the infant, we'll say toddler, um, may become fearful that the constant object, which is the mother, won't be there for them in the way they were before as a secure other. So they become anxious and may be fearful in this process of uh, identity forming. Yeah. And it's a really pivotal point when you think on the timeline of, and maybe not in the past, but of children nowadays, between the age of 18 months and three or four, they're usually going off to nursery. I think there's very few families now that, you know, the the, the mother or the father has the luxury of being at home with the kids all the time. So that the natural progression of children now happens at that pivotal age of separation and individuation. Right. And I think that's a big thing. <laughs> oh, it's an extraordinarily big thing. You know, and the child's perception of being abandoned is different to us as adults. Do you know oh. what I mean? Being left at the nursery after being peeled away from your mother's legs at half past eight on a Monday morning it can be seen or interpreted as abandonment by a, a young child. Yeah, I don't know. I remember, and, and Steph, who's downstairs, would remember he, perhaps even more keenly than me, um, the first time when Jessica, at the age of maybe two, yeah, first time we took her to the nursery uh, and we practised leaving her for maybe two hours yeah I, um maybe even less but leading up to four hours um and i know stephanie felt it felt this very challenging you know handing her child or a toddler you know jess to the nursery absolutely so i know that it's Steph, I'm not saying Steph feels abandoned, she's not in front of me, but she felt very anxious. Yeah. Leaving Jess for two hours or one hour, however it was long. Because up until that point, um, you have a different developmental stage. So the mother and the child um, are far more fused together, if you like. And this yeah. is a stage where the infant is starting to make steps of individuation hopefully with the knowledge that the mother is a constant, secure object yeah. for when they return. Absolutely. And it's that secure attachment and that, you know, safety and security around it all, for me, that's the, the really important thing. Mm. Mm. Having been a foster carer, do you know what I mean? And, have you know, seeing teenage boys that have no attachment to people around them and how that can impact on them. 
do you know what I mean? That they refuse to attach to anything because you're just going to go anywhere. That's right, because this stage, if it's healthily, this stage doesn't have any hiccups and it's healthily yeah. processed, um, will mean that the child as a template of secure attachment yeah. is really important in terms of self-esteem and self-agency. Absolutely. Yeah. We'll talk a bit more about self-agency, what you mean by self-agency, because I think we talk about that quite a lot in these podcasts. Well, self-agency is really the term uh, where we we take our first steps behaviourally. So with the with the architect of our own agency, in other words, we take our, the first step, not only physically, but psychologically that we have motivation and energy to be able to move out into the world in this case. Yeah. Uh, so if somebody, but later in life, somebody comes to be like, I was thinking the assessment and the person was depressed um, and had no motivation to get out of bed, felt incapacitated. And there was no motivation for self agency. There was no motivation to, to externalize. In other words, they stayed internal, incapacitated and passive rather than external in the world. Okay. I think I get I think so, yeah. Well, basically it means if you if you're gonna have self-agency, you you externalize, don't you? You move. Yes. You, you take yourself somewhere. Yeah. You're, you're sort of like uh an agent of free will. That's what self-agency. Self-sufficiency keeps coming across my mind. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You have a sense of... To do these things on our own type thing. Yeah. That's right. You don't yeah. stay incapacitated and passive and stuck. Yeah. And wait for other people to think for you. Wait yes. for other people to psychologically rescue you. Wait for other people to do any, everything for you. You take a self-sufficient step to create autonomy and what they call in the psychological book self-agency. Yes, yeah. Because the opposite of that, and I think one of the things that can happen at this age that we're talking about, the 18 months to three-year-old bit, is that, you know, they can we can create a symbiotic relationship or a very much a co-created, do you know what I mean? Because you said right at the beginning of this about you know, our main caregiver and, you know, that attachment that we have to them, it's really important that we separate out from that. Yes, otherwise we end up in a symbiosis, in a fused state, and there's no identity for me. Yeah, so there's no self-agency. We're constantly reliant on somebody else. We're always forever. reliant on someone else for yeah. our autonomy. Yes, yeah. Which in any relationship is not healthy. <laughs> Which is the worst place. Yes. So some of the problems which occur at this particular time, we'll just take one of them. So for whatever reason, if, if the significant caretaker um, doesn't support through positive strokes or encourage, put it that way, the infant, toddler to take these first psychological steps and first physical steps into the world, world without them, or at least without perhaps close proximity and knowing that the other person will be there when they come back, um, that leads to a fearful or can lead to the infant seeing the world in a fearful place yeah. or never doing it. Yes, yeah. Or staying in a sort of engulfed womb-like state with the mother. Yeah. So the you've heard of the borderline personality syndrome which is often talked about uh, in all the literature yeah the the source of the borderline personality goes back to problems in the separation individualization stage it's when the mother doesn't encourage and give strokes yeah yeah because they're they're quite narcissistic in themselves and they feel abandoned by the child that they have been, you know, uh, looking after, for example. 
they feel abandoned by that they take it personally so instead of encouraging the infant to move away they don't give them any strokes yeah so the child of course strokes is like a unit of recognition it's like oxygen yeah yeah okay they will seek negative strokes for those positive strokes but if the mother is giving lots of positive strokes to not go away or not to take st steps, you end up with an engulfed symbiotic process where the child only gets strokes for not growing up. Yes. Yeah. In other words, they stay, they stay in an infantile state, dependent on the mother who's giving them all these strokes for staying in the world, rather than in inverted commas, taking the first steps of psychologically growing up. Yeah. So in the borderline process, where there's this always switch between being very, very needy and very, very angry, has its direct source back to problems in the separation individuation stage. Yeah. So it's, it's a really important stage in our development oh, oh. Yeah. i had something today for example uh, assessment and they one of the, they came with depression and anxiety but they also came with codependency in other words they said oh the relationship i've just had has followed the same pattern yeah where the partners have said you're leaning on me for all your needs i feel like your therapist I feel like you haven't grown up psychologically because there's no self-sufficiency. There's no sense of being able to meet your own needs. There's yeah. no sense of reaching out to anyone else. The whole psychological process is leaning on me. So that's what we mean by codependency, where two yeah. people act as one. And in this case, the uh, romantic partner felt that the other was almost giving up ownership of their own agency and leaning on the other person to do all the work. Yeah. And that's, I think it's really interesting that we can kind of relate to our early, you know, our upbringing to how that plays out in relationships later on in life. That's why, you because, know, you know, I, I don't know, you and I are developmental psychotherapists. In other words, we look back at how the past affects the present. Yeah. If there's been problems psychologically in various developmental stages, this is one of them. Yeah. We can see how it gets played out in relationships and life later on. Yeah. Yeah. Because to me, relationships, you know, when we, we first get in a relationship, we, we're like all consumed by the other person. We want to be with them 24 seven and we, you know, eat, drink, sleep, all everything together. But then we move into the next phase of the relationship where we're a lot more secure and we can kind of go out with our mates on a Friday night and come back knowing that the other person is going to be there. And that's how that's I it. see that being healthy correct. in a relationship. That's correct. Now. That's yeah. the healthy bit. But yes. you imagine if you've got a very fragile template that steps, stems back from yeah. the problems in the separation individuation stage, where the secure object isn't secure. Yeah. And I see fear and panic in, in clients sometimes, do you know what I mean? That it's all the world's falling apart around them. And it's it's not. It's you know, it's it's rooted back in that earlier phase. That's right, because they've internalized yeah. a mother which doesn't give them encouragement or in tear language positive strokes. Yeah. Or developing the beginnings of their identity. So their identity becomes dependent on this significant others, um, positive strokes, encouragement, and being there in a constant way for them. Yeah. If that's not there, or there's some doubt about that, then they've internalized a template where, which is built on fear, panic, yeah. anxiety, that if they grow up or take assertive steps, the other might 
act out in ways which uh, means that that template, that secure attachment is threatened. So how do we work with somebody like this in the therapy room? What well, do we do to, to build aware. that self-agency? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, I think the first step is that the therapist needs to be aware and think developmentally. Yeah. In other words, they need to have a, a way of thinking which isn't just CBT about changing thinking and behavioural process in the here and now. I'm not saying that won't, no, won't work for certain people, XXX, but, but they need to think about, well, what developmental stages might have been missed out, might have been problematic, and might um, be the origins of some of the difficult processes that the person's come with, in with today. Yeah. Because if they're not thinking that way, then they don't go to the next step, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. They they don't even think about it. They yes. look for they go to problem solving. Yeah. Yeah. Or they go to solution focus. So I was going to say solution focus, what you need to do in this situation and give yeah. them a load of yeah. 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 And I'm saying that might not work it might not help in the moment, but only for a certain amount of time, I think. So this is a different type of post. This is really psychotherapy we're talking about here and therapists thinking developmentally. So if they think, first of all, developmentally, developmentally and they're aware of all the things I'm just talking about here, okay, then through the process of regression with the client, they can help the client make connections or at least a hypothesis about deficits, things that weren't met, relational means that weren't met in those early stages. Yeah. And how the therapist can help the healing of the unmet relational needs so they feel the ability to be more secure and attached when they enter relationships and go into the world in 2024. Yeah. I can see maybe the next question you've got to me, which is how do you do that? But are you following the thinking? Absolutely, anyway? absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So the next step is I'm going to, you haven't asked this, but I'm going to just say it anyway. How do you do it? Well, first of all, you need some training, by the way, to think this way and then to, to have some training how you do it. But the first step is to see yourself as the therapist. Uh, as the secure object for the client. Yeah. Now that only come um, through a deepening of a robustness of the relationship between the therapist and the client, where the client can trust that the therapist isn't going to go away. There's a sense of predictability. There's a sense of continuity. So the client is able to trust in the therapist's presence and predictability and stability. Which is, got that, can be quite difficult to build with some clients. You, you know, if you have a week on holiday or if you're taking some time off, you can tell the clients that have maybe had disruption in that early years because they, they panic. <laughs> I can't cope not seeing you for a week type thing. Yeah. This is where the therapist needs to plan ahead. Yes, yes. And inform the client of the process way ahead yeah so they can deal towards with, it yeah 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 they can deal with the process there's a there's a <laughs> uh, it was a it became a cult um dvd a long time ago and it came out in an i think it was the late 80s it was a long time ago so i don't know how many years but it had the person who was the lead actor in um, Groundhog Day, Bill Murray. Oh, yeah. And uh, Richard Dreyfus was the other person. And Bill Murray played this paranoid, um, borderline, obsessive client. And this, Richard Dreyfus played this um, narcissistic therapist or analyst because it was set in America. So it's analyst and patient. It was a comedy, actually. And 
this narcissistic therapist took on this client when other people wouldn't take him on. In other words, um, the therapist phoned Richard Dreyfus appealed to his narcissism yeah. that he could actually cure anyone and pass this client on to him. So in this, I won't tell you the whole story, it's called What About Bob? That's the title of the, the DVD. So it'll be on Netflix, Netflix or something, somewhere. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Very briefly anyway. So the, so the, the, the paranoid clients, um, paranoid disorder with OCD and various other things turns up to Richard Dreyfus. Richard Dreyfus takes him on. Unfortunately, Richard Dreyfus, within about four sessions, something like that, says, oh, um, well, therapy's going to stop for four weeks, at least a month, while I go on holiday. Now, in America, you go on holiday for a couple of months. That's how yeah. everybody goes on holiday in August or whatever it is. The paranoid client is totally distraught and goes into OCD checking and how he can cope and this, that, the other. And then Richard Dreyfus just goes off. Now, I don't want to spoil it all, but then what happens, Bill Murray decides to, you might want to call it stalking, if you like, uh, follow him to his home. <laughs> Eye on him, <laughs> make sure he's there. <laughs> yeah. Because if you think about the individuation separation stuff I'm talking about, yeah. and if you think of the therapist being a work at this developmental level, then the therapist needs to be a reliable, consistent, predictable self-object so the, 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 the client can actually trust them enough to do the work they need to do. Yeah. And this film might be quite extreme, but I think it's a good way of you know, letting us see inside the mind of somebody that's got insecure attachments. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, and so I'm not, I'm not going to tell you the ending, but I, I wanted to say it because it, it's it, it's like if you've got problems, it doesn't mean you have a developer paranoid personality disorder, but if you have problems in the separation individuation stage, you may have self-object um, issues. In other words, in relationships and social relationships in later life, you may not have the secure attachment template to be able to feel, you know, self-confidence and self-esteem to be able to have healthy relationships in a constant way, for example. Yeah, yeah. Or you might always feel anxious that the other person is going to leave you or they're not going to be there or XXX. Yeah, and I can imagine... You know, in a relationship, that's it's exhausting. It's exhausting for both parties. One, the one that thinks the other is going to, you know, constantly go off and leave them, and for the one that needs to constantly be proving to that person that they're not going anywhere. It's it's not conducive with a nice, relaxed, positive relationship, is it? No. So the therapist, you want to say, how do you do the healing? and work with the unmet relational needs and the problems in that early stage. So the therapist needs to take some time with the client, building up this safe, predictable um, process. So the, this will take a lot of time, by the way, it's not going to be done overnight, it's going to be many sessions, and I'm sure the client will test out the therapist, but hopefully get a level of trust where they can believe that the therapist works you know, cares for them, isn't going to go away and will be there for them. And so you start to build up a secure attachment system. Yeah. Now, this isn't straightforward because for somebody who's got an avoidant attachment system or an anxious attachment system where they fear that the other person's not going to be there for them, then it takes time to build that up, doesn't it? It's not yeah, going to be absolutely. Yeah. overnight. Yeah. But once that has been built up, then... Uh, Actually, in the present, you're starting to help heal the unrelational need, needs and deficits of the person who perhaps didn't receive that type of consistency, that type of stability, that type of security all those years ago. So by osmosis, they take on the therapist's modelling and the therapist's sense of security, care, predictability, uh, and they internalize that. Yeah. And they're then able to, to 
you know, have that safe, secure other in their heads as they practice being, you know, in relationship, sex, you know, whatever it is. In yeah. Present life. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, there are things I, I've known therapists that have, you know, and it, again, I just relate this back to younger kids when they go into nursery or they go into the first day at school is to have a familiar object with them that they can carry with yes. them to school, yes. like a constant yes. object. And I've known therapists when they go away on holiday sometimes to give certain clients a constant object. <laughs> I did it. And in the sort of psychological jargon, that is called a transitional object. Yeah. So they they have that that object with them, which becomes connected psychologically. Yes. To yeah. The therapist, whilst they're not there. Yeah, it's kind of blanky when you're younger and you go into nursery or something. You've got something that you can fiddle with or that is just familiar. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Very important. Now. If these problems or unhealthy problems um, don't get worked out in the separation individuation phase, the next developmental stage where these unmet uh, needs will rear their head is in the adolescent period between yeah. 30 and 21. Yeah. Some people say now 12 and 25. But, you know, I'm just going to say the adolescent, the adolescent period. Because it's in the adolescent period where the person has a, a second go, if you like, in yeah. saying no, um, moving off into an oppositional place with their significant others, um, forming their own identity away from the other yes um, yeah. staying in their bed all staying in bed all day um or whatever it is that will frustrate the parent yes yeah, yeah. We've, you know, we've all been there yeah and adolescent becomes a often a fraud time for the parents and a very challenging time for the adolescent but absolutely vital absolutely pivotal so there is this, there is the adolescent time where the adolescent can attempt to repair yeah. with a significant other what didn't happen in the separation individuation level. Yeah. However, if that those problems are repeated down adolescent, like you know where they come from, yeah. yeah, if yeah. The, a uh, significant other is, you know, over nurturing or over clinging or neglectful or doesn't give strokes for them, you know, starting out for themselves, then problems become even more magnified. Yeah. For when they start to go in the real world. Yeah. And again, I, you know, I can see that with my own kids and everything and how important it was, but it's also as a you know a, a caregiver as the a mum we've got to look at it from their point of view do you know what I mean it's a transition for us as parents that our babies don't need us anymore but we've got to allow them the freedom to go and to live their own life and to have that self-agency mm. you know so, so it, it, within a family unit there's these different parts of like evolution if you will that we need to go through these different phases yeah, and if there's problems in the separation and vegetation state, and then problems at the same sort of level we're talking about yeah. in adolescence, yeah. then those problems will get played out in social and romantic relationships. Yeah. See, this is this is the thing with psychotherapy that I loved when I was a foster carer and when I was doing my training, because I was fostering while doing my training, was that that teenage phase, that 12 to 18 or 12 to 21, meant that as a foster carer, I had the ability to help fill in the gaps that they maybe didn't have earlier on. And for me, that gave me a lot of hope. It's not like we just get one chance at this. <laughs> And, oh, well, that's it, you're broken for the rest of your life. No, there's, there's phases throughout our life where we can go back 
Mm. and you know fill in those bits that maybe we didn't get when we were younger and I love that about psychotherapy no you're absolutely right and so the adolescent period necessarily has to be full of conflict yeah yes now, yeah now of course I don't know people listening to me or my say what but they have to be because that is where the teenager is starting to develop their own identity yeah. in a much fuller way. So they need to be in conflict or opposition with the uh, you know, the parents. And of course, the significant other people bring them up may have a very fraught time yeah. and have a huge sigh of relief when the teenage years have um, gone and the, the uh, adolescence moves into you know acting out their full developmental their identity put it that way which is removed from the um, parent process so things can go wrong there and here's another example for you so a client walks in at the age of 32 got problems in romantic relationships it's very passive um wants the partner to do all the thinking for them um leans heavily on to the other partner and when you say how was your adolescent years 12 13 14 15 17, oh you know it was wonderful um and so i say oh really so what what happened oh there was no conflict whatsoever you know it was full of um just happy times where i did what my parents said and i don't i don't uh, recollect any conflict whatsoever now when somebody says that i start have a red flag appearing in my head interesting because it, what happens then hopefully they might start through therapy having a late adolescence in their 30s yeah and that's interesting because i was one of those kids bob <laughs> There we are. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And and necessarily so. Um, because you know, it didn't happen at those needs, self-agency fundamentally, perhaps didn't happen at separation, individual stage got built on in terms of not happening um in developmental processes in their adolescence. And then they come to therapy talking about codependent problems rather than having a interdependent process where they have an identity and the other person's got an identity and they will work together to communicate yeah. and have a healthy relationship. Yeah. Because that's what adolescent years are about. That's what separation think, and individuation is about. Yeah. I think for teenagers, it's their job to push the boundaries. And I think as yes. parents, it's our job yeah. to have boundaries in place that offer safety and security. You know, I've had clients that say, oh, I got away with murder. I was allowed to stay out till really late and I could come home when I want. And, you know, all my mates were saying, oh, they wish they had parents like mine and everything. And yet, as adults, they were really anxious. And well, that's the extreme. That's the other end. Where the, there's, where the, there's, yeah, there's where different the extremes and the impacts on us just as bad either end of that extreme. Yeah. <laughs> Completely right. Where the parent doesn't provide a structured and in TA terms positive controlling parent, then what happens is the uh, infant or adolescent hasn't got an internalized parent figure that can give them structure or you know guidelines under stress. Yeah. So exactly what you've just said yeah they might stay out till three or four o'clock and all the things you talked about because they haven't got an internalized parent which can tell them well look if you go to if you go to bed at three o'clock in the morning you're going to fail your exam yeah oh you've got you know if those boundaries aren't set by the parents then it's they a don't scary place as well for an adolescent if there's no line in the sand do you know what i mean it's like well, okay how far can i go when when, when are you going to step up and regulate my behavior and it's a scary place to be 
Absolutely. So the problem is then, if that's the situation, they either become self-reliant loners where they have to meet their own needs, but they yeah. haven't got an internalized parent that's going to guide them in a positive way. So they end up perhaps in extreme support um, sports or they end up and they find themselves in extreme areas of danger or yeah. a chaotic process going on. And that leads to really big problems in life mm -hmm. where their ability to self-care yeah. is limited because they haven't internalized a positive controlling other that can set boundaries for them in selves in life. Yeah. So I think it's been quite a heavy episode, this one, Bob, but I, I I like episodes like this because for me, it's all about reflection and it's all about looking at the impact of things on us as we're growing up, but bearing in mind that we've always got that opportunity to reparent or to fill in those missing parts. Yeah, I agree. So can I say a couple of books? Absolutely. Okay. So one of my favourite are authors of all time around this stuff that we're talking about here is Jean Inslee Clark, who's passed away now. Yeah. And you've probably got books by her. I'm just looking up there. I've got quite a few. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and she was dealt with all the things we're talking about. Now. And um, I think one of them is called Growing Up Again. Yeah. Another one's called Developing uh, another one is talking about dealing with the self-indulged child or something like that but the author is Jean Inslee Clark and she writes um, wonderfully in this particular area yeah if you want to go to a psychoanalytical, psychoanalytical analytical literature which is years back in time book I'm going to separate it's called separation of the young I think it came out in about 1954. Wow. But why I like it is because it not only talks about the problems in the separation individuation phase, it has very stark black and white pictures, which shows um, what happens. And I think one of them is the the um, mother is taking the two and a half or two year two year old boy to hospital. And they're holding hands as they go in, and that's the black and white picture. Then the next black and white picture is the mother and the young boy come out. The mother goes that way, and the young boy goes that way. And if you think of 1954, whenever that book came out, late 50s, the policy for then, not now, was that if the, in the toddler or had to go into hospital, for example, overnight or something, the mother couldn't stay there. Absolutely. My sister, that happened to her. She was in hospital for over 12 months. So and the child feels, yeah. feels abandoned and left. And that's what I mean. Yeah. There's a separation of the young. Yeah. It's, so it's a very, I think, insightful book. It's very old, but it's a good book. The Jean Inslee Clark books are in the last 10 years. Yeah. Well, Bob, I've really enjoyed that one. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So in the next episode, what we're going to be looking at, another interesting topic, is power dynamics within the therapy process. What a wonderful title. And actually, you know, I, I think in the training of people to be psychotherapists, this should be talked about all through the training, the clinical training, because yeah. it's fundamental to um, effective and healthy therapy. So until next time, Bob, thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.